We got pretty much everybody here. Welcome to the first active teaching lab of the semester. Uh, my name is Lane Sunwall. I should be able to see me on two different pictures, one on uh, the camera in the back of the room here in B78 and Engelman Hall. And then uh, for those of you online as well, uh, there is the webcam uh, that's looking right at me. Uh, if you are online, uh, I'm going to send to you uh, a handout uh, digitally, I'll do that right after David's uh, presentation. Uh, for those of you in the ho in house, there is a handout. Uh, we're bringing those back. Uh, so this will have just kind of some step by steps on some of the experiments that we'll be going through today. So if you do have a laptop, that would be awesome because we will be able to uh, kind of follow along with us and work through some of these experiments, some of these ideas. Uh, if you are needing some of the URLs, uh, I don't want to have to type everything in. There is a QR code on the front here. Maybe that'd be of use. I don't know. I just throw it up there just to, to give that a try today. Uh, thank you, all of you, for joining us here in Face the Face. It's so fun to see so many people here today. And then also for those of you online, thanks for uh, showing up and uh, participating online as well. Welcome to all of you. Uh, today, I am going to uh, get us started here. Excellent. Oh, I'm showing up here. And uh, we'll get started. Uh, I would uh, like to first welcome uh, our virtual guest today, our virtual speaker, David Delgado, uh, who is the Canvas administrator for Canvas. He does pretty much everything that keeps the lights on as regards to Canvas. So he is pretty much, uh, you know, the heart and soul of, of so many, many of the uh, uh, IT operations that we use in our classrooms all the time. So uh, I really appreciate David taking the time uh, to come and speak to us today. Uh, so David, uh, he is uh, joining us virtually. Welcome, and uh, please feel free to begin. All right, thank you very much. Just to confirm that you can hear me okay? We can. Okay, uh, if there are questions, Lane, feel free to interrupt me um, and I can answer them or save them for afterwards. Um, to go ahead and get started here, um, understanding that many of you have likely already seen previous episodes of this monthly um, shared science fiction adventure, I wanted to give a little bit of grounding to ensure everyone is on the same page and to pave the way for understanding both the limitations and the future that, that you've come here to discuss. Um, now, generative AI is a subset of artificial intelligence where human-related relatable information is generated using software and large sets of data to create things that mimic what we create. And that data is saved in a very large file that is designed to mimic some of the mechanics of our own brains. For our discussions, we're talking about the most popular large language models, consumer text generation among an ocean of countless tools. Uh, the top of the pick today is our chat GPT, Bing chat, Google Bard, Anthropic Cloud 2, and then the list goes on and on and on at this point. Additionally, there are models which run on personal computers, uh, such as Llama and Llama 2. These models were created by Meta, and they have spurred a feverish pace uh, to grow easy to customize, e easy to experiment with personal models as quickly as possible. Some examples of the most popular local large language models are Falcon, Wizard LM, and Orca. And they're less capable than the cloud services for now, at least, but they are more designed to specialize. And so um, the idea is that if you need a specific type of functionality, you can install them directly on your computer. And Microsoft, Google, and a bunch of other companies have experimented with models like this, too, with the aim of installing it into your computers directly. G a all generative AI gains its power from information that humans have created in the past. Uh, the foundation for most of these models is information from September 2021 and earlier. Now, there are some exceptions to that, especially when you deal with the local personal models, but that means that there's a knowledge cutoff um, that they have to deal with. Um, and so, you know, their knowledge isn't limited, especially with newer stuff. Um, and there are also other kinds of generative AI tools, um, Im image generators such as Midjourney and Stable Diffusion, and one of the tools that we'll be looking at shortly, uh, Bing Chat, which has something called Dolly 2 in it. Um, those three are the top of many text to image generation tools. If you can open up your mobile phone and search for them, you'll see just laundry lists of the tools out there because they're so popular that work on that do any kind of variation of what you could ask for. 
Um, generative AI can also create voices that mirror ourselves. I could take a recording of myself that's of poor quality, go to a, the Adobe podcast site, and use a tool that they have publicly available to automatically regenerate my audio completely cleaned up. Um, tools like Eleven Labs will go and clone your voice. Um, we've all we're all familiar with the with the suspicious um, deepfakes of people saying things that they didn't say before. We may also be familiar with the with the mobile apps that let us swap our faces into movie scenes. Or we, you know, you may have seen a YouTube video. There was one circulating around the other day of well, the first of many, many out there of Homer Simpson singing "I Did It My Way" with all the uh, with all the emotion and emphasis that Tony Bennett did. Next slide, please. So here we are in September of 2023, a mere 10 months from the generative AI explosion of 2022, and generative AI to grow and to act as a starting point for what most of what we do, right? Uh, students can use generative AI to do a lot of things right now. Um, through browsers or without extensions, entire papers of dozens of pages can be summarized into bullet points or, pres or presented to someone with dyslexia to help them understand. Um, everyone in the world with reasonable access to the internet now has their own personal assistant to help brainstorm, um, have discussions, to proofread, to collaborate as if they had someone else there who was an expert in their subject, to col or even help research with it more the more internet grounded tools. Uh, for professional or personal reasons, role play is an exceptionally strong suit of many large language models, right? Um, you can ask the model to role play as someone in a profession, a well publicized or published famous figure, a patient, a customer. It, it runs the gambit. You can ask AI to review an image and describe it, or describe why something is in the image, reason what's going on or what's going wrong. You can even ask it. Um, some tools have even demonstrated competencies in diagnosing and solving structural and technical issues through pictures, like what's wrong with the building or what's wrong with your technology. They can not only interpret, but they can discuss the nature of the picture or write alternative text for you and, and even transcribe it. ChatGPT, Bing Chat, and some Google, and now, <clears throat> let me rephrase that, and soon Google can also not only look at data and understand what the data is, but what it's but write its own code to do what you need it to do. You can upload data with geolocations to a map, a spreadsheet to provide data insights, and even ask it to conduct statistical and probability analysis. And also, through plugins with ChatGPT, people can have virtual conversations with the content of PBF, PDFs, documents, spreadsheets, videos, and basically anything else you can think of. Um, the plugin just came out the other day that allows ChatGPT to talk to Canva. I know, I know that knowing that it's a popular presentation application. The latest in the first generation of generative AI are able to search the web and try to ground their statements in current, in current facts. And web-enabled AI can also tell you and have conversations with you about local events, news, and culture. Next slide, please. So I speak all of this in positive terms, of course, where there are people who will use the tool for good intentions, and there are those who will use it as a shortcut to complete what they might perceive as work, uh, perceive as work that is too important to mess up or too irrelevant to spend time on. AI has been with us for a long time, right? It's helping. It's been here with us a long time. It's embedded in our word processors, in our grammar tools, in our phones, soft keyboards, and our chat applications, right? If you happen to be one of the people who use Instagram, uh, it's there chatting with you. Face Facebook, it can chat with you there too. And um, while considerable effort has been undertaken by some, AI works cannot be reliably detected. Um, among even the best AI detection tools, the error rate is reported to be greater than 3%. That means that for every 100 students in your large course, you're likely to either be falsely accused of using AI or using AI, or they are using AI, but slipped under the radar. Um, and even in cases where text can be fingerprinted, the idea of tracking the origin and creation, one-click tools can change text in such a way as to entirely negate the, fin entirely negate the fingerprint. Now, Microsoft Copilot tools will be in Microsoft 365 
um, by the end of the year and might very well be available to at least some UWM faculty. It comes at cost, so that, that discussion has to be had. Um, and Google, at cost, already offers their Duet tools um, to workplace customers. So while it's less capable than Microsoft 365 and create templates that can provide draft copy, design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The bottom line is that our future is likely where you're here. And that is to learn how to integrate it for our benefit, seek out, um, teach our students how to use it wisely and to help define the future of how AI will be leveraged by the professional of the future. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about the tools at UWM that we have available to us. Um, to leverage AI, um, you need tools. And what we have published for the guidance on the application and communication of successful use, UWMIT is work currently working to not only provide general guidance for all UWM business, but to define next step to supporting generative AI as part of the business end of teaching and learning and student success. And there are two options right now. Departments can choose to go through the IT procurement process to purchase a monthly subscription of ChatGPT+, Plus, which is $20 per user. And as part of that procurement, UWM, UWM Information Security can clearly describe what your business purposes are, which can be safe to use in the tool. You know, they'll tell you what's, what's cool and what you probably shouldn't do because it puts the university or yourself at risk. With ChatGPT+, Plus, um, users gain access to the latest models with abilities, plug in to extend ChatGPT's abilities and the ability to analyze data and have ChatGPT write software for you in a far more intelligent way, one that it can use to go back and clean up its mess and analyze, analyze and you can have an active conversation on what the application can do and how it processes your data. More importantly, I think, in early October, UWM faculty and staff will gain access to Bing Chat Enterprise, which will allow UWM employees to use generative AI grounded in the internet. And BCE can generate and analyze images. It can write code. It can write documentation. It can develop writing prompts and role play. Students will not get access to BCE and can choose to use whichever AI tool is appropriate given the context that you set for the course and the need for, and the, need for the course. Next slide, please. All right. So with Bing Chat Enterprise becoming the first enterprise level generative AI tool available for business use at UWM, there are some serious considerations we have to keep in mind before we use it for everything, right? Um, in le th thoughtful use. Um, in legal agreements and public statements, Microsoft's committing to not save or inspect user data submitted to BCE, Bing Chat Enterprise, right? Uh, this means it's safer to use safer to use in FERPA applications, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't anonymize your data to play, continue to play it safe. No statement, implicit or explicit, has been made by UWM Information Security regarding the use of BCE and HIPAA or a private or you know private health information. So just assume it's not safe right now. Um, we have there are a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, in comparison. Uh, we can make some general statements about other tools, including ChatGPT+, Google Suite, Google's tools, Microsoft's public tools, etc. Data will be stored for 30 days or more. Uh, it might also get used for developing future models. So the consequence, the consequence is, if you haven't, if it isn't ultimately in the public domain through work, avoid using a public service for it. Our student records are not in the public domain, therefore we shouldn't, we should avoid using them in these in publicly available commercial tools for example next slide please All right i have a few examples lined up for you and actually one of them is oh it's back yay okay i was gonna say i had a, had to run a backup here backup plan because uh just like the way the internet works if it's if you need it it's down um but let me get my screen shared going while you're doing that Oh, what's the timeline for having Bing uh, for Microsoft Bing Enterprise to be integrated into 365? Do you have any dates on that? It is not, it is not something that will be integrated with 365 per se. It it won't have access to your UWM data that you don't explicitly give it. 
Um, it just happens to be a version of Bing Chat that sits inside of the same agreements that the rest of Microsoft 365 does. So you can use it for class stuff? Uh, yes. Yes, I'll just put an asterisk by this because I am not the authoritative person to answer that question. But that's the idea. Yes, we, we want to give something safe for faculty to use um, as, as quickly as we can muster to develop a community. Um, the timeline for that is sometime at the end, by the end of September or early in October. It all depends on when Microsoft hits the switch. I do not have permission to screen, Shirley. You should did right. You see it? Uh, yes. Stand by. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, wonderful. So uh, this is going to go a little bit out of order from the slideshow, but that's okay. Um, because sometimes you have to improvise. Um, since ChatGPT wasn't available at right the second I was lo loading up my uh, presentation, I ended up switching over to Bing Chat. In this case, I'm using the public version. I can show what the private version looks in a second. Um, I asked it, and, and there are subtle differences between Bing Chat and Bing Chat and ChatGPT, even though they both run on the same technology. Um, because of the way the tools are configured, um, this one automatically assumed that I was doing it for nefarious reasons. In this case, I was asking for this for this example to write a computer science assignment for a 200 level course where students work in a group of two or three to solve the Tower of Hanoi problem using pseudocode. Um, this is a common programming problem gives given to students to teach them how to write programs that you know operate a particular way. Um, and it actually came out and said, I'm sorry, but I can't do that, Dave. Um, I, rep I replied to it that uh, I am, in fact, an instructor. I'm not in this context right now, but it, you get the point. And it's like, oh, okay, fine. So I'll reason with you, and here's my assignment. Um, and it went, it went far more into detail than I was expecting it to, but I was very appreciative of the fact that it did. And this is... This is a fantastic starting point. I read through it. It's it's a decent version of the assignment. Um, I said, this is great. Now, please create a holistic rubric. And it did. It only made one level. But if I were to continue having an interactive conversation with it, I'd be able to come back and tell it, you know, please make more levels and cover these topics. And then it would do all that, that, that work for me. Um, this is something that can be done with the free version of GPT, of chat GPT as well. Um, the next is the next. Uh, example I have is using it to generate image image text for you. So in this case, I have I asked it to create an image to go along with the text quote, quote Bonnie the cat was curious to smell the delicious food on the top of the counter when she always thought of as her higher oh, I am having such a hard time talking this morning. Forgive me. Bonnie the cat was curious to smell the delicious food on the top of the counter, which she always thought of as her higher floor. The pie was almost Em emanating light and wow. this is these are the four pictures that generated for me based on um, my description and this is again this is dolly 2 this is a free service integrated into bing chat and bing chat enterprise for that matter uh the next example i'd like to show you in this space is it analyzing an image so in this case i gave it a, an mind you i'm going to say this right now these services are still a tiny bit buggy um, and they're going to be for a while because we're on the first generation of them. So um, you'll see sprinkled warnings everywhere about how if it doesn't do what you expect, you know, let them know and provide feedback. And I've found that as time has gone on, the models have improved and the ability to do things has improved. Um, I was having a little bit of a fight with it because occasionally it forgets that it can do this. Um, but... I, after a little bit of experimentation, I asked it, what is this image? And I gave it a map of Vatican City. It did a little bit of searching, and it gave me a little bit of background. It did some infographic stuff, and it also described some of the things that were noted in the map. And I asked it for a little bit more information on what those things were in the map, and it listed them off. And each one of these is, in fact, in the map. And you'll see here that it's also giving me sources for information about those particular places. And we see them listed here. Additionally, it also gave me, because this is a publicly available, you know, thing driven by ads, um, 
<laughs> Here's some ads on how to actually go there. I'm going to switch over to ChatGPT. And here is the assignment that I was trying to replace because it, my mine wasn't preloading. But uh, this is an, an international communication 200-level um, course assignment that's designed to work with a group of two to four students. And the idea is that... Um, and I want them to do a critical analysis of real-world cultural differences. Um, and in this case, it gave, again, a relatively decent assignment. I don't know if it's using the same instruments I would, but that's okay, because it's intended to be a starting point, a draft. And this one gave me a much more detailed and elaborate rubric to deal with. Well, and uh, it even gave me a little bit of guidance down here, as if I don't know what I'm talking about, even though I asked for it, but that's okay. So on this slide, um, or on this presentation, I used one of GPT-4's advanced data analysis tools. I gave it a CSV file of electric vehicles. I asked it to analyze the data set, which it did. You see here, it's telling me what each of the fields are. Now, I gave it no prior information on this. I also didn't have a fantastic look at what um, the data looked like beforehand. So it's asking if I would like to explore specific elements of the process of the data. Um, and it tried doing stuff. Let's see if it shows up. Yes, it does. This is it's showing its work, just like we um, just like we ask our students to do. Um, experienced a problem. It went back. It tried fixing it. It went back again. And okay, here we go. It works. And it did what I asked for, which was plotting out the density of electric vehicles and changing a changing their icon color for the type. And you'll notice this gigantic green glob in the upper left where Washington is. I have thought it was perhaps an error. Um, so I asked it to do something. So I asked it to zoom in, and uh, it did. And it turns out that those are actually reasonable plots. <laughs> um, and then we had, and then we went back and forth about borders and such, because there's no Washington state boundary. And that's okay. Um, if I were to do a different chat with it, it would have worked just fine. Um, so those those are my experiments right now. Uh, or not experiments, but my um, examples um, that just demonstrate some of the power. And uh, so I am going to turn this back to Lane Sunwell so that he can continue the discussion. Thank you very much, David. Does anybody have any questions while I'm setting up my own stuff, either online or face-to-face? -face? You can put it in chat. I have a question. Yeah, please. So for ChatGPT Pro, what's the difference in the analysis capabilities in that versus just the baseline version? ChatGPT free um, can do basic analysis and reasoning within the ability of the model directly. So um, I can give it a number of problems and, and make no mistake, GPT-4, um, if it's available to you, is very good at this. But the free version doesn't use GPT-4. It uses an older version. It's the version that we received right out the gate, uh, which isn't bad, but it isn't as good. Um, if you go with GPT, chat GPT+, plus, you get not only GPT-4, which has a better internal reasoning, but you also get the plugin so that it can do more advanced things. Like, for example, you could enable the Wolfram Alpha plugin, and then it can do higher level, much more higher order math, naturally. Um, you can also um, use the advanced the advanced analysis tool model specifically to do all of that. What I was demonstrating: the math building, the statistical analysis, and such. Okay. I have a question online. Can you use Chat GPT to analyze images, graphs, and tables? And if you have GPT Plus, yes. So yes, you can. You can. You can also do it with um, Bing Chat Enterprise when it's available to an extent. Because that's using ChatGPT, right? Right, because under the hood, under the hood, Bing Chat Enterprise is GPT-4. Yes. So, um, David, you mentioned that you can put in multiple documents and have it chart graphs, like the map that you showed us on electric vehicles. When it takes in that data, does that data then become part of the database? So we may be putting in very credible information, which then enhances the database, or people might be putting in information that is not credible, that is 
deteriorating it? How does that factor in? To the public's knowledge, not the way that you're thinking. Okay. Um, what ends up happening is when you use that advanced mm -hmm. analysis tooling, um, a kind of sandbox is created in the in the in the cloud. And whenever whatever work it's doing is done inside that sandbox, and there's an expiration timer on it. So at some point, at an hour, two hours after you're done with your work, that sandbox will be automatically destroyed. So they may keep there may be traces of it lying around, but it's not integrated into a database per se. So when you say the thirty days that it, it can save information, it's it's not using the information; it's just holding it doing what it would like with it, but not releasing it to the public. That's a fantastic question and an important distinction that needs to be made. When you do the data analysis tool, the data you're shoving into it goes into a sandbox, but the conversation itself isn't in that sandbox. It's in ChatGPT. It's kind of like a you asking ChatGPT to create a portal to another space that it also has access to. So the conversation that you have will be retained at 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 best for 30 days if you're using chat gpt plus and hit that switch but if you don't do that then that conversation will become become part of future training data excluding the data you uploaded thank you so i have two more questions from online uh, three more questions uh is it reasonable to assume that a student can impersonate an instructor to get the results code for the tower of hanoi uh, problem? Absolutely reasonable. And that's why it's important. Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, as done in previous conversations, Lane has pointed out that that part of the mitigation strategy for this is getting students to show their work. Um, because yes, absolutely they could. Because the model that ultimately doesn't know who you are or what you do. You It, it, it has no context, so it can, you could can lie and it's, it doesn't know. Is there an AI tutorial for instructors and students? I mean about commands and usage. Uh, I am actually meeting with University IT Services in a couple days to talk about this exact thing because it's it's on our plates, both U University IT and CEDLs, to develop a, a community of practice at UWM, and this is the first step to that. And so some of this information will be able to precede and some of it will grow over time. So what I can say is if it isn't out on the first go and I intend for there to be at least some, it will definitely grow um, quickly. And it's also about conversations too, right, David? So like absolutely having, having conversations here at Active Teaching Lab or having conversations with other instructors as well, just like talking about this and really working through how it should be used, how it can be used, what are some of the problems with it. Um, I think it's it's not so much just a, here's the AI book for dummies. It's about a longer conversation as these tools develop. In more than one way, yes. Yes. Uh, simple question. Should we use our UWM emails to sign up for the free version of ChatGPT or other emails? Uh, the last time I checked, it wasn't actually possible to use our work emails to sign up for ChatGPT. So you would have to use your you would have to use a personal email address. Thank you, David. Thank you for the questions. And I'm keeping my chat board up, and I am going to uh, move on then. So I'm going to talk a little bit less about the technology side of it uh, and talk a little bit more about the practice of AI in the classroom. And I always start with this picture uh, every time I talk about AI, uh, one, because it's changing so fast that it's it's really, let's try to have this baseline of a calculator. I was trying to keep this in my, in my back of my mind as well, because really I think of ChatGPT and AI more broadly as just a calculator. It's, it's really good uh, at imitating the events that happened around 1970s when uh, Hewlett Packard uh, and uh, Casio and all the other companies came out with the first handheld uh, calculators that everyone in the math departments thought this would be the end of the world. Why would any student learn two plus two equals four when they could just punch those numbers in? And what we really found over the course of a gener couple generations, 50 some years, is that math didn't go away, it just evolved, it just changed. If you expected your students to act as if a calculator didn't exist, they were probably going to cheat. So you had to anticipate the usage and how people would be utilizing a calculator. And indeed, using a calculator became very important to doing math. 
And so I really think of generative AI in many regards as a calculator for words for pretty much anything that we possibly can teach. Because one, it's here, right? Just like the calculator, it's not only in this handheld format from the 1970s, it's in our phone, it's in our computers, it's everywhere. Um, it's going to be used whether we like it or not. Uh, and it's also really good at basic and rote tasks. And I'm trying to underplay that a little bit, but I just want you to think about it. It's really good at basic and rote tasks. Maybe that draws into question, what should we be having our students doing? Um, and also it's really good at being perfectly average because it's really good at taking all the basic information that's there and just kind of regurgitating, maybe remixing it a little bit as well. David may fight me on this, but I think of it as a great B student, right? Just that perfectly average student. We all like those students, but that's what chat GPT, that's what AI really is. Um, so I was thinking about that, and uh, this is kind of how I've come to grips with AI. And I, so I started thinking about four different things to talk with you about today. So what is the impact of this word calculator on education? Uh, what are some classroom policies we need to think about? Uh, what are some ways that we can use AI to save some time? I have some ideas because every time I prepare, I over prepare. And so I may not get to all the experiments that I have planned, but there are some really cool ideas here. You can use the play around with this. Um, and then finally, we're going to look forward to some assignment techniques. And those, that's going to be kind of my hook to reel you back in uh, in later months for Active Teaching Lab. Because again, this is an ongoing conversation. So what is AI's impact on a education? So uh, one, uh, students are going to use it to cheat. That's, that's a shock. <laughs> uh, but really, this is one of those things that I always come back to is that students have been cheating before AI. I mean, this is a, a thing that happened before this January and early, maybe November of last year, students were cheating. Indeed, uh, recent studies were showing either at UW-Madison or some larger one at uh, uh, University Ethics and Higher Education, uh, between 44 and 60% of students were regularly cheating on their work. Right? They admitted to it. Maybe they weren't doing it every day, but they were admitted to cheating uh, in their work during the semester. Um, one thing that I think is important, just as I think is important with the calculator in the 1970s, is that if you just go on doing nothing, just keep treating your classes and nothing happened uh, since 2022, um, the number of students who are gonna be cheating are, are gonna go up. So I think it's important for you as you're thinking about what can I do about AI in a classroom is to get in front of it and be proactive about that. And even uh, this semester, be thinking about how you can adapt what you are doing to the reality of AI. And I think it's also really important as well uh, to combat this cheating is to really explain to students, what is it that you're doing in the class? What is it you're having to do? Why are you making them write a thesis statement for the hundredth time, right? What's important about doing that? Because otherwise they can just do it on chat GPT. What's important about doing the thing that you want them to do? How is this going to help them talking to students, explain to them the point? Because I think what we want to not do um, is really uh, kind of a more uh, defensive position. So, what, you know, going back to what David was talking about as well, should we, should we be using AI to catch cheaters, right? Like maybe that's how we could use AI to integrate that into our classrooms. Like really, that kind of turns into the Ed Rooney approach of education, right? So if you're familiar with uh, the my favorite uh, movie, a, a Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, Ed Rooney was the principal who has spent the entire day chasing Ferris Bueller and his friends around Chicago trying to catch them instead of, you know, running uh, the school, because he's the principal of this entire high school. Uh, so I think having this approach where we're really focusing on using AI or just uh, really having this like defensive posture in regards to students is really almost self-defeating. It's going to undermine the effect uh, with our, our, our relationship with our students and really mm -hmm. what we're largely trying to do. Also using AI, as David was saying, to try to catch cheaters, not only has software limitations, because any software tool that we use is going to going to be, um, you know, there's the problems with it that David was pointing out, the 3% variability. There's also the FERPA violations if we're uploading student work into chat GPT specifically. Uh, maybe Microsoft Enterprises a little bit later will be somewhat different. Um, but I think really it's about undermining student relationships, having that defensive posture. So what are some things that we can do then to craft and enact effective policies? One, I think, was, uh, was talking uh, to students uh, and but also, I think being very clear what constitutes cheating in your classroom. Uh, and this is one thing I always get from instructors like, what is uh, a syllabus statement that I can put up 
uh, for my students in regard to, you know, AI in the classroom, what's ethical use. And we have some of those. We, this is available at CEDL's website right here. This is uh, uh, right here. There's also other sites that we, I think we have linked to as well um, from different schools that have their policies for AI that are just suggestions. And I think you should think of them as suggestions because the learning objectives of your individual course, your course, your course, your course, everybody's course is slightly different. And so the use of AI in that course, what constitutes plagiarism, and what doesn't, is going to be slightly different before that course. So explain to students what your policy is regarding AI. Have a clear policy, but tailor that to the learning objectives of your course, right? So, you know, students submit, you say, well, I don't want students to ever use AI. It's like, well, that might be a problem because what's the difference of using AI to edit a paper that you've already written the rough draft? What's the difference between using AI to edit a paper, giving you a second draft, than it is having your friends or family edit that paper and give you feedback as well, right? If the student is trained to use that ethically, they can use it very effectively to, you know, instead of bothering their mother at, you know, 12 at night, the day before the assignment is due, I, I might have done that, uh, to uh, instead of bothering their parents or your friends at midnight before the assignment is due, they could go online and you could have ChatGPT kind of give you an overview of that assignment, what you could do to improve it and work through that and make those improvements. But they have to be trained on how to do that ethically. Otherwise, they'll just put their really crappy draft in and then, you know, pop and paste whatever they that comes out. You need to train them and talk to them. What is an ethical use of this? Working through that with your student I think is really, really important. It can really help uh, us avoid that Ed Mooney approach. Um, so I think uh, what I always try to focus on is maybe a more positive interactive relationship with students, one that we have conversations with students where we're interacting with, maybe even joking around like, you know, welcome back, Carter. Uh, so having that more positive relationship, I think, can be really helpful uh, and um, and not, a bit, uh, you know, not going to that restricting that cart launch. But what if cheating does occur? Because, you know, again, that 44 to 67 percent of students have already admitted to cheating using AI. What do we do then? I think so. There's a couple of things. One, I think the studies have shown that if you just talk to a student and say, hey, look, I see you, uh, I look at this paper, it looks very different from your other submissions. Uh, it uh, you know, doesn't really fully answer the question. Explain to them why you think that this may be a problem. And uh, just discuss, like, did you use, and just ask them, did you use AI for this assignment? And you're going to get a number of those students saying, oh yeah, I did. So again, I, what I think is important is, you know, we take into fact account that 44 to 60% of students are gonna cheat. The number, the goal isn't to stop cheating you know, completely. That's not going to happen. It's just to lower those numbers. And I think this can really help you just talking with them. There's other two other options. There's two different philosophies on the next steps. One, you can just um, rate it uh, because ChatGPT is really good at being average. Uh, it's really good at just kind of giving you a generic answer. Uh, you can grade it really harshly as a result of that. Or I've had some instructors tell me that, you know, when they get really bad papers, they just don't grade it at all. And they just talk to the student and say, look, I'm not going to grade this. You obviously didn't spend any time on this. You obviously, you know, use some sort of tool or there's some very big problems with this paper. I'm not going to grade this. You can do you redo it, resubmit it, and then I'll take a look. at it. So just having two different, no, those are two different approaches. I've had instructors do both. I think both have some merits to them. Uh, it really largely depends on, you know, what your time limit looks like. I mean, is correcting a really poorly done paper in a 100 level English class is that's going to take some time over hundreds of students that may not be possible. Uh, so just really thinking about what it is that you want to have happen in your course and how you want to interact with students as a result. All right. Um, the other thing I think that's important as well is to realize that just as we're in here trying to figure out how to use AI in the classroom, we're trying to understand, I get lots of questions on like what is proper ethics for AI. The students have the same questions as well. We think of students as digital natives. That means they need, they know everything about anything that has ones and zeros, right? Uh, and that's not the case. Students are working through the ethics of AI just like we are, right? Just like my generation was working through the ethics of Napster. Uh, you know, I was like, oh, well, my friends shared their CD with me. What's the difference between sharing CDs amongst thousands and millions of friends online? Uh, so again, really thinking about students are working through the ethics uh, of of AI, just as you know, we are working through all these issues surrounding AI as well. And so talking with students, I think again, coming back to that can be really important. Um, the other approach I think as well uh, is really to using uh, AI and leveraging its abilities for our own advantages. Uh, and so 
reducing the amount of time we can, you know, uh, David showed us an example of him building a rubric. I think that's one thing that we could do, or I can walk you through that a little bit as well. Building a rubric, just putting in some of our assignment prompts in chat GPT, and it'll pop out rubrics. I guess one of the things that I always talk about as CETL member is the importance of transparent grading, uh, talking, talking to students about like what it is you'll be you're grading them on, why you're going to be grading them that way. Uh, and that a really good way of doing that is rubrics. And how many times do I use rubrics? Or did I use rubrics? You know, it's like many semesters, it was, you know, zero. Right? Like I, I wasn't able to do that because it takes so much time to build a rubric. Last semester with ChatGPT, uh, I popped in my assignment instructions uh, online. And about five minutes later, I had a really nice rubric already loaded up into Canvas. Uh, so it can really help you with those rote and basic tasks, right? Just popping in these words over and over again. That's what a rubric is. Uh, and AI can be really good at that. I also sometimes might use it to write emails because I'm somewhat impatient and Sarah might note that I don't answer my emails as fast as I possibly could. Uh, and so this is one of those things. Again, AI can be really useful in generating an email that's kind and generous uh, and not as impatiently sounding as I sometimes am. The other thing that I think could be really cool about AI uh, is creating a cre um, custom um, you know, assignments and examples. Because, you know, we always have these instructors, uh, these students that, you know, that these A plus students that are like, oh, wow, this is the perfect example of the paper that I wanted students to do. And you have these great examples that you can show students like, oh, hey, student A, thank you so much for writing this great paper. Could I use this as an example? And then subsequent semesters, you use that example, you pass that out. Um, it's sometimes harder to get the, the C students and the F students to say, hey, can I use your really crappy paper, the one that I gave you a big F on? Can I use that as an example of what not to do? Then generally, you don't get as many takers for that. Uh, AI can help you with that. Uh, so again, creating examples or even remixing. So again, if you're doing a, a, you know, um, an English course and you're trying to under, you know, get students to really get interested in iambic pentameter, right? you really want them to understand what iambic pentameter is, but they can't get over the Middle English. Uh, that's you know Shakespeare is using. Uh, maybe inter you know insert a Taylor Swift song, have it remix it in iambic pentameter, and voila, and you have a, a different example that you can use for students to give them an example that maybe they don't have to focus so much on understanding the language; they're already familiar with it. But now they can kind of see how the structure works. And I have an example right here. Uh, and so this uh, I got creative one day, and I went to ChatGPT and I asked it to rewrite um, "I Love Rocky Road." in ionic pentameter. So if you know what that is, that's by Weird Al Yankovic. Uh, and so right here, right here we have uh, I Love Rocky Road, which is itself a play on a Joanne Jett, I Love Rock and Roll uh, from 1983 uh, album, I Love Rock and Roll. Uh, so here we go. Um, oh, why must you be a fussy youth, my dear? No Captain Crunch, no Raisin Bran, you'll steer. Aware you not of the hungry and need a steer? So eat, consume it all, let go the fear. And then it goes on and on. Uh, you can read the whole thing. It's it's really well done. I know Weird Al Yankovic. I don't know uh, iambic pentameter very well, uh, but this is a really good you know capturing of that of that song. Um, and if you know, uh, also this is not actually Weird Al Yankovic. This is again. I just love how the AI in this movie came out. This is uh, the Weird movie with Daniel Radcliffe. So that's actually Harry Potter playing Weird Al Yankovic, doing a play on a Joanne Jet. I love rock and roll. It's just amazing. All right, so, so I think as well, the other examples you can use, well, this is again, I was using before with the examples of the, you know, the poorly construed assignments. And so again, what you can do is you can work with students and say, okay, here's a bad example of some writing, right? About beavers, right? Uh, in various ecosystems, the industrious activities of beavers are observed. Trees are felled by them, with the wood being used to construct elaborate dams and lodges. And we can talk to students in this class, like, what's wrong with this? How can we improve these, this statement, this paragraph? And so, again, these are those examples that you can, you would normally take a long time to have to write these all out. I remember writing these. It took me forever to create a crappy draft or something. Uh, and then you talk to the students about it. I did this in like 30 seconds, right? It said, write me a, um, a paragraph about beavers in passive voice. And then it wrote me an example and I said, make it more passive. Just like, I want more cowbell here, more passive. And then so I had three tries and it gave me this. And so this is something I could just pass out to the students and we could all work together. It's like, how do we improve the writing here? So I want you to break off into groups and you talk about how you would uh, improve that writing. I want you to talk about, you know, how you maybe improve the second half and then we're gonna work together to create a better draft of this paragraph about beavers. Right. So again, 
creates these endless examples that you can use to work with your students. All right. So finally, I think uh, what's important as well is to be really thinking about how we can use AI to improve student learning, right? So thinking of positive ways that AI can be used that's ethical, uh, that is uh, going along with the learning objectives of your course. So AI is really good at taking the average knowledge of the world and kind of condensing it all into a paragraph format for you. So having students using it to maybe brainstorm. Right? So what are some, um, you know, uh, let's talk about, uh, I want you to think about all the different um, uh, 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 festivals that are going on in Milwaukee. And I want us to write an essay about this. What are the different festivals that are going on in Milwaukee? We can go to AI, figure out what festivals are going on. Like, And so you can, you can keep on doing that for pretty much any topic that you want. You can have AI create a, a list of examples or come up with a, uh, a business plan uh, for a, um, uh, a, a comment for the business fan for um, that involves shoveling snow or, you know, using the tops of yogurt lids, whatever it is you want to do, thinking of some ideas. They're just maybe random, but you can have students then brainstorm those through with AI and then start working on one of them. Uh, it's great at editing. Um, it's also really good at filtering information as well, giving you a paragraph format of, of content that filters out some of the background noise that we don't always want on a regular search engine result. The other thing that I really want you to be thinking about as well, besides the fact that we need to get in front of it, because AI is here, it's a calculator, it's in the student's hands, um, but it's also a skill that students need to learn how to use, right? So when we're teaching math, I'm not teaching math. I would never teach math. When Ed is teaching math, uh, part of the skills that students need to know in a math class is how to use a calculator effectively. Right? So if they don't know how to create the brackets or to create these, uh, these, these equations and put them into a graphing calculator, uh, they're going to be, aren't going to be able to complete parts of those assignments. So we need to be able to teach students how to not only use calculators, but also how to use these word calculators, how to use AI. What does it mean as a 21st century skill to use AI? We need to help students with that. We need to be wrestling with that ourselves so we can teach students that. Because that's, again, one of those great questions that we're coming from online is, well, what's the guidelines for this? Well, we, we're still coming up with them. What does it mean to, have, to use AI in a math class or a science class or a nursing class or a history class? I, I don't know. There's not a textbook on there. We're developing this right now. And I think it's really important to help our students understand that as well because they don't know how to use it. And if they don't know how to use it, the likelihood of cheating or using it unethically goes up, just like I was downloading all those songs on Napster back in the 90s. Says that Moses Rhymes, right? I don't know, it's free music. Uh, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Before we go into, I'll uh, give one little pitch, before we go into some experiments, uh, that's just what we're going to be talking about. It's like some strategies specifically on utilizing AI in the classroom. Uh, that's what we're going to be doing the rest of this semester. Uh, in Active Teaching Lab. So uh, two weeks from now on October 4th, and we'll be sending emails out, but just to keep this in mind, um, uh, Louis Scheidt is going to be talking about teaching with AI, helping students understand the ethics of AI and how they can use it ethically in their courses. So she teaches online courses, which is a real kind of danger zone for AI because there's a very difficult time to get students in the classroom and doing some of these things face to face which is how we often say, maybe you can combat AI is doing active learning in the classroom. How do you do that online in an asynchronous course? Louis Scheid is gonna be talking about that. Um, we're gonna be looking at student engagement with AI uh, from Deanna Wesolowski. I probably butchered that name. Uh, and uh, then we're also gonna be looking at AI and writing uh, as well from uh, some good folks at the English department. So um, Sh um, Siobhan Watson, Maureen McKnight, David Cosi. So that's what we're going to be doing throughout this semester in uh, Active Teaching Lab. Uh, but for now, uh, if I wanted to look, kind of give everyone an opportunity to ask some questions, if there were any. Yes. How is it working in other languages? What is that? Do you know anything about this generative artificial intelligence in other languages? In other, other languages? Than, other than English. So David, I, I mean, I can talk a little bit to the fact that it will have conversations with me in German. Uh, which aren't that bad. Uh, my German's crappy, but I understand a little bit of it. And it will talk to me in German. I've had it talk to me in Spanish and my daughter takes Latin. She talks with it in Latin. Um, but David, do you have any thoughts on more details on that? I know we've played with it a little bit. It's understanding of, I know medieval Spanish is somewhat suspect according to you. 
<laughs> yes, indeed. Um, the more common it is on the internet, the more likely it is to understand, um, just because of the way the data was put together. In in a lot of Western languages, um, ChatGPT and other current models are better at translating than existing Google Translation tools, and and so Google is is realigning the way Google Translate works to match. But especially, but in some, but translating to Western languages is always a challenge. Um, it does okay. Like I've I've talked with Korean friends who have confirmed with me that yeah, it's a little it's a little bit one to one, but yeah, it it gets there pretty well. Um, better than a lot of stuff they've seen. Uh, there is a lot of work by Meta and a lot of companies in China in publishing freely available open source models that are finding their way into the commercial space that are better at translating. So the the answer is. Yeah, it's not bad right now for most for most common languages, and there is an iterative process where on if every six months or so it will get better. Thank you. Yeah, um, I liked your examples of giving it uh, or using it to create good and bad examples. Yes. How is it at citation? Good and bad examples. Okay, so Chat GPT, D David, you can correct me. I still see it hallucinating <laughs> like totally just randomly just popping stuff up and, and and it doesn't exist and indeed i remember talking with uh heidi uh libraries uh and she was saying yeah it, it's still like we still get requests in from students for books that do not exist because they do not exist <laughs> and uh so you know they're getting they're like oh we would like this book and this book by this author it's like oh, that, that never this author didn't write that book uh, and so it's very good at giving you uh, a title of a book that author could have written or should have written, but not very good at giving you, you know, I, it does, but it, it doesn't, right? It works until it doesn't, like David was saying on the internet. The other thing as well is chat GPT. Every time I ask it a question, it's very good at citing Wikipedia. It's great at citing Wikipedia. It cites the heck out of Wikipedia. And so chat, so Bing AI it uses ChatGPT, but it also checks itself on the internet. So it will give me real sources, but those sources tend to be from the usual suspects, right? So it's not really digging in depth. When I ask it questions on, you know, 16th century Tudor uh, parliament, it was giving me great Wikipedia articles. And that's about the extent of it, right? It wasn't really doing a lot of legwork that I would ask it, a student to do. Even on Google, I could get much better results from even not behind paywalls. It's just that it takes the path of least resistance because it's the most popular. Result. Does that answer the question? If I, if yeah, I might add, um, it's also important to note that the information that Bing Chat and Google Bard and and Google SGE are going to return are only as good as the internet that sits on top of it. Because you hit it right on the head, it's only going to return information from the most popular sources because it's working on the assumption that anything further down the search page, just like we do. Um, how many people actually go past page one and the and the chat bots that are serving on top of search are the same way. So an exceptionally good SEO web page, search engine optimized web page that bubbles up to the top is going to be one of the first sources it cites. And it's kind of good at filtering through that, but it isn't always perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, something related to books that don't exist are books that are now being created and published sold that don't have real authors and don't have good information. So I saw um, a science communicator posting about books about scavenging and eating wild food that like had the potential to kill people because they were not containing credible information, but they were available to purchase on Amazon. So I don't know like who the middle player so it's like is. Self publisher groups yeah. that are right, harvesting things and publishing things, but oh. without credible authors. Wow. So, so that level of terrifying. That's interesting in terms of like the importance of teaching students the importance of publisher publishing houses as well. Yeah. So much a question, but maybe a, like an observation. I know how first year English program really integrated like digital literacy and into their you know, curriculum for like 101 and 102. I'm wondering if there's like, if there, if there would ever be any kind of thought of creating like a one credit AI ethics, like that oh, yeah. new students, like freshmen could be required to take, or I think that would be a great idea. Yeah, that, I, I took my freshman year, I took a, um, not ethics, but more of like just 
how do you do searches? Like when you had to use LexisNexis and it was yeah. not less conversational or just how do you search a library system? Like it was a one credit course that changed my life because I could understand how to like manipulate these que these queries to get the results I wasn't wanted. It wasn't just a, you know, one question and that's it. It was really teaching the skill that's necessary. And that's since it has potential to really like, you know, math for students and teachers, it'd be great to okay. have some kind of required credit. Yes. Just, yeah, sir. Um, just to build on that, the library has been so generous and they have a whole page about how to cite AI would just link to the Google page, but they also will allow your classes to come in and they'll teach your classes how to do searches or citations or concept mapping. And so even if that's something you can't cover in your class, you can have your class go and they will do that for you. And so, um, they're a really great campus partner. I just always say good things about the library. I have well, six experiments. I uh, um, have a couple of uh, just basically kind of walking you through ChatGPT, uh, Bing AI, and Google AI, uh, kind of signing up what they're good for, how do you get them, how can you use them, what needs a paywall. And then on the back, I have some experiments on how you might use them, right? So I talk about creating an image from an, uh, for an assignment, creating a rubric, it is magical to see your assignment prompt turned into a table format rubric. It's just it's a thing of beauty to see this thing happen. In a, like it just Maybe it's just me watching the matrix too much. It's just fun mm -hmm. to watch AI just like go down there and create this thing into a table. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Check that out. You do have to play with it, right? Like, you know, create this as a rubric in a table format. You have to program it to do what it wants you to do. The last thing as well is you can use it to summarize a web page. I am going to excuse everybody because I know you have lives and you need to get out of here. So if you need to go, please go. I, there is no judgment whatsoever. I am just going to walk through though, just um, the limitations and the possibilities of being AI summarizing web pages because that is something that kind of blew my mind as well. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate that. I hope to see you back on October 4th to talk about AI ethics and how training your students on effective use of AI. Uh, I'm just gonna spend just five minutes here just walking you through though, uh, just the summarizing of web pages in Bing's uh, web, um, uh, Bing bar on the side. So this is using right here. Thank you all for coming. But, so you're, you can leave, but now I'm gonna keep talking. All right, uh, so this is uh, Microsoft Edge. Believe it or not, I actually downloaded voluntarily a uh, web browser created by Microsoft. That was the first time since 1996. And then I went to Netscape and never went back. Uh, so I downloaded uh, Microsoft's Edge browser. If you download Microsoft Edge, not only does Bing Chat work, because you can use Bing Chat in anything now, uh, but you also hit the Bing sidebar. And that's really cool. See, thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, that's really great for, you can just do Bing Chats. Uh, you can have it compose emails. Might do that a few times. Uh, you can also just, this insights is, is okay. All right, so chat though is really cool because what's nice about this is that it embeds big chat into whatever web page you are on. All right, so you can now run Bing, Bing Chat on the web page you're on. So I am behind a paywall as well. And that's the other important thing because Chat GPT doesn't work behind a paywall. Bing AI chat, Bing AI doesn't work through a paywall, but now it does because I have it opened on the sidebar. So I went to the Wall Street Journal, uh, logged in. And here's an article on um, basically, you know, the mafia state of, uh, of Russia kind of talking about, you know, some of the issues uh, with Russian politics. Uh, and so I can uh, just type in here. It's like, you know, please, because I'm polite. Uh, come on. All right. uh, please uh, summarize this page in 200 words. So give it a number of words you want. And now it's going to look through. It's going to read this page, which it could do if you just went to Bing AI or Bing chat. And now it's loading it. So it's reading what's going on here. Uh, and it's giving me a page, a, a summary in about 200 words. Uh, so, you know, give me the author, uh, essay by Michael uh, Kimmage, uh, former U.S. State Department official. Uh, essay argues that uh, it goes in, a, in I, I can't do Russian. Um, uh, Symbolize the evolution of Russia into a mafia state held together by violence and incapable of global um, uh, leadership. So again, this kind of does a fairly decent job of summarizing this page. I was blown when I first saw this happen. It's like, how am I ever going to teach students to read ever again? Uh, so if they can just do this. Now, there's a couple things. One, 
I've heard a lot of instructors, uh, some instructors uh, that are wrestling with say, hey, actually, this allows me to give more advanced assignments, more advanced papers to students that maybe they can't read or they don't understand fully, or maybe the English isn't their first language, or maybe they're dyslexic. You know, this opens, broadens horizons. So I was like, okay, that's interesting. It did a pretty good job on, you know, like this is a 12th grade reading level. I mean, this is the Wall Street Journal's basic newspaper. So I, I thought I'd up the, uh, I thought I'd dial things up a little bit. And so I went uh, to, uh, I took out a PDF of an essay by G.R. Elton, a household name, I'm sure. Uh, so this is a document I read for prelims on early modern uh, English uh, history. Uh, so this looks at, uh, this is uh, G.R. Elton. He's one of the, like, just really influential in terms of, of 16th century English politics, understanding 16th century and 17th century English politics. G.R. Elton is the person you want to go to. Uh, and so this is Tudor government, the points of contact. And I said, uh, chat GPT, not chat, Bing AI, uh, please uh, summarize this PDF uh, I got to be specific. The PDF on this page uh, in 200. If I don't say PDF, it'll actually read where this website is. And that's actually at a file folder. It'll say, oh, this is a file folder. Um, so it's reading this page. This is, a, this is a, I'll upload it. I got this from JSTOR. Um, this is a chapter from a book. No, it's not. It's actually an article um, from G.R. Elton. That's correct. The historian of Tudor England. That's correct. Uh, the chapter discusses the nature and development of the Tudor government under Henry VIII and his successors. That is correct. The main points are, let's read them. The Tudor government was based on the personal rule of the king who had absolute authority and power over his subjects. The king was assisted by a small group of advisors known as the Privy Council who were loyal and obedient to him. The Tudor government was also supported by a network of local officials, such as justices of the peace. The Tudor government was efficient and effective in maintaining order, collecting taxes, and administrating justice. Uh, the Tudor government changed and evolved over time as different kings had different personalities, preferences, and policies. The government also adapted to the changing social and economic religious conditions of the 16th century. All accurate, right? What does that sound like? Well, exactly. What it sounds like a Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. It's not a Wikipedia article. Did read this, but it's crap. Uh, so this is not an article that would be like you know foundational that you would read in prelims, right? From the books that you an instructor would have you read, they would not have you read a Wikipedia article, which is basically how this described it. Uh, if I look at my notes from this, uh, this is really more about how the Tudor government was able to incorporate um, potential rivals into itself and to uh, achieve social stability by incorporating the uh, lead and the, and the people who are very you know, skillful at being politicians uh, into the government. So to keep the troublemakers in government so you can keep a close eye on them so that your government doesn't dissolve into instability. And then he argues that the Stuart government, the successors of the mm -hmm. Tudors, did a really poor job of that. And that's why you have the English Civil War in 1640s and then the Glorious Revolution in the 1680s. So he's really making a comparison between the Tudor and the Stuart governments and talking about the problems within the government structure of the Stuart elites and why um, then English this, England descended into civil war in the 17th century. That's what the paper was about. It wasn't about, oh, this is uh, you know just a description. So what I'm trying to argue is that on some things, chat, GPT, Bing AI will do a really good job of summarizing. So like a newspaper article, it does a really good job of summarizing a newspaper article. A more complex, abstract, technical content does a poor job with that. So again, this is where I think it's something for us that's advantageous. This is one opportunity for us to teach our students what AI is good at. It's also really good for them to be, you know, even like having students to compare these two, to having them, and then also teaching students good reading techniques as well, showing them the limits of AI and how you can maybe, where, how you can dig deeper. Where do we dig deeper? How do we read content better? How do we understand content? So again, I'm just trying to illustrate some of the, the limitations of AI. Will this improve next month? Maybe, and then all this conversation will be out the window, I don't know. But this is where the state of AI is now, and it's been for the last couple of months when I've been playing around with this and doing this experiment with these specific documents. That Wait. is all I've got for you today. Thank you for staying extra for some bonus time uh, today, five minutes more. Uh, thank you all, all of those online, and uh, have a great uh, next couple of weeks. We'll see you October 4th. Wait. Thank you. Yeah, I did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um
This is very much one of those things where it's a scratch the surface kind of question because there are variations on the prompt that you can give. Yes. That will ask it to dig deeper. And and just like with the other, just in the sake of having the conversation, the power of this is that you can have additional conversation on it. Yeah. Um, so you can, in your initial prompt, you can ask it to look for particular aspects. You can ask it to to evaluate the pros of the language. You can ask it to look for specific subjects. And if it doesn't turn up those things in the first in the first run, you can continue to have that active conversation to tease out those details. And and that becomes the literal active, the active learning activity, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And knowing how to do that, where to do that, how to push, where to push. I think that's a really good point of how do you transform this even more. So that's a really good observation. Thank you, David. I have a quick question since um, you're still here. So I put up something very specific. I use my astronomy course rather. Um, I, I want students to think about how they connect to astronomy in their daily lives. That's one mm -hmm. of my missions because sometimes people don't, unless you put it in front of them, they don't realize how often they refer to celestial objects. Um, so is that, so I asked them, they have readings often and they're short readings. And I asked them, find the thing that confused you and find the thing that you connect with and explain why, how does this, how do you connect with this? Is that the sort of thing that AI can do well or not? Say no, but David, what are your thoughts on that? I, I would also say no, because unless they're asking the AI to operate in a particular role, um, it's not going to have, it's not going to simulate, I should say, opinions one way or the other on that. Um, it it would be a much, it would be much easier and a much more practical way to use the tool to explore the various dimensions of how, of how it intersects our lives and then, you know, working, helping the student work through the ideas around that. But, uh, but no, it, if you were to ask it to kind of fudge that, you wouldn't get very good results unless you were very specific and strategic in the way you prompted. Okay, well, I guess my a goal at this point isn't necessarily for them to use AI. I just wanted to find out if that's the sort of assignment that makes them think and doesn't necessarily, wouldn't easily rely on AI. Yes, I think okay. I would. That, to me, that those asking those questions that ask them, you know, their opinions, their reflections, their understandings are much more resistant to AI, especially if you're doing that in the classroom as well. Uh, okay. Because, yeah, like David was saying, that it's it's going to take. That's the other thing that I talk about, and that I didn't want to, you know, put all the cats out of the bag. But I mean, <laughs> we're talking about the next few weeks as well. Is that you know how strategies of um, different strategies to. Uh, to make AI, you know, make your assignments more resistant is to ask those very, those exact types of questions of how, you know, what is your thoughts on this specific thing? How does this relate to you? What are the things that you thought was most interesting, intriguing, or that you understood the best? And what didn't you understand very well? Those are questions okay. that are very, I think, resistant. Um, okay, AI. one last thing, and I don't want to overtake the time, but I, I'm very curious about email writing, but not to make them more verbose but to make them clear is there yes. are there schemes in ai that you can say does the, how how do you tell it is this a clear message or what do you think this is saying how would you do that i that's what i i will actually write in it uh usually what happens is ai is more verbose and then i tell it to trim it down um okay. and then uh it will also though like you can say you know what is the what was the main point of this email I'll ask that sometimes, or I've asked that more on like paragraphs that I put in there and then it will identify the main point. And then I'll use that as kind of the, the leader or something like that, just to play around with it. But I mean, the strategies are basically having those conversations with AI because the conversation you're having is really prompting a tool to do what you want it to do. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. This was really useful. And as a total beginner, <laughs> this was good to show the kinds of capabilities it has. So thank you very much. I thank look you very much. The rest of them. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye.